Good day YouTube, warbles on a lot here. Seeing as I was already wearing my aeroplanologist's hat in order to talk about the progress over the past 35 years in solar powered flight and human powered flight, I decided to leave the hat on and go for the goggles as well. Though I think I'm going to have to substitute the granny glasses while we go for a little bit of a look through the archives and I'm going to show you what I thought solar powered flight was likely to develop into based on you know my pontifications 12 years ago. Here we have the Warbles on a lot aeronautical archive stack which shows Pacific Flyer magazines mainly which I've had articles in since September 1999 when I wrote in and let them know that hanging in the Inverell Transport Museum was the world's first legal minimum aircraft and I'm the last halfwit who had it off the ground under its own power. This little boy turns 24 next week. The girl's nearly 23. And there's the 1975 Skycraft Scout hanging up over our heads in the Inverell Transport Museum. And the kids have been hearing the stories and seen photographs of it since they were interested enough to ask Daddy about, you know, tell me the story of your first aeroplane, Dad. But there it is in 1978 in the backyard in Glen Innes. And I brought it home on the roof of the Morris 1100. And you'll find that magazines for people who muck around with little aeroplanes, they're fairly happy to have articles by people who have photos and stories. I used to work on both of those things. So, for a while there I became a, quite a regular contributor. By June 2011, I was getting top billing on the front cover. Sorry about this, but we have to interrupt the aeroplaneology for a bit of kangaroo feeding. Oh yes, you can cope with me wearing a funny hat. Won't hurt you at all. And the white wing chuffs, they all get a feed as well. All right, fellas, now let me get back to the movie. Renewable Energy and Recreational Flight by Chris Wharton, a feasibility study. One of the most persistent mantras we hear these days from the globalistic techno-economists is the advances in science will in the future allow us to replace our old, nasty, fossil fueled lifestyle with modern, green and renewable technologies. But I suspect that most of these rosy economic theorists have never sat down to consider how much energy lies in a cup of petrol. Nevertheless, it has long been the pastime of mine to consider how we might manage to go flying without burning any fossil fuel, at least for the launch energy. If you try to screen fossil fuel out of the manufacturing process which led to the flying machine's construction, well that almost renders it impossible. Think about it. What's the fossil fuel footprint and the carbon footprint of that thing? $115 million. If Otto Lilienthal could fly on the power of a salad sandwich in a foot-launched hang glider made of willow wands and Irish linen, if the cloth was made in a water wheel driven mill and imported on a sailing ship, then Otto Lilienthal was the world pioneer. There he is. See? It can be done. If you were to be a serious fundamentalist greenie, there the subject stops, but I'm not quite so unbending. I think I swallow the notion that it's acceptable to pluck some of the more appropriate fruits which dangle on the tree of knowledge while they're available. Thus, if there's a modern epoxy glue in existence already manufactured, then I, as a vegetarian greenie, would prefer to use it rather than personally going out to attack and kill and dismember and render enough of a cow or horse to make the glue to hold a wing rib together. Regardless of the toxicity of the processes, the risks involved in breathing its fumes and the pollution which has already gone on to put the tube on the shelf. 
So, anything you can buy is acceptable today, perhaps. Big question mark there, eh? The most immediately obvious way to go flying on renewable energy is to replace the LPG or butane which they burn in hot air balloons with methane, generated from whatever garbage you shovel into your methane generator. Chook poo is considered the absolute best crap going, if you want to try this, followed by pig poo, cow pats and then all forms of vegetative stuff in that order, with people poop roughly equal to the pig poo. The problem is that methane has only about half the energy to be found in LPG, and litre for litre, LPG is only about 90% as energetic as petrol. Another is that while LPG liquefies at 100 pounds per square inch, which is easy to engineer, methane doesn't liquefy below 5,000 psi. And constructing something to pump, compress and contain liquid methane at 5,000 psi is so intensely hard to achieve that even the wildest automotive enthusiasts don't bother to think about it. They squeeze it into long, narrow, thick-walled steel cylinders at a, quote, mere, unquote, 2,000 psi. To make enough methane to run the motor, to compress enough methane to drive a six-cylinder car 160 kilometres or 100 miles, takes only one tonne of cow splats, which is why my car breathes LPG, or it did back in the day. These days it drinks petrol, different car. A slightly different approach would be to begin with the methane and catalytically crack the hydrogen out of it and just play with the hydrogen. You could burn it for a hot air balloon. The balloon would be very wet inside when it cooled down and it might in fact rain on the basket all the way through the flight, which doesn't appeal to me. With this renewable captured organic hydrogen, there would be nothing to prevent a Zeppelin type dirigible airship with either electric motors running on hydrogen fuel cells or hydrogen burning internal combustion engines or cover the top of your airship with solar panels and run electric motors. I'm going to cut out a fairly large column of controversial stuff about whether the hydrogen is actually safe in an airship or not because it, the jury's still out on it. All you need to worry about is that in every greenhouse climate yet modelled, predictions are for the intensity of all meteorological disturbances to increase, and dirigibles are huge and hugely vulnerable to high winds. And so is this thing. Size of a jumbo jet. Built like an ultralight. Therefore, maybe a pressurised hydrogen blimp fueling its power plant from the internal overpressure. This could give you a two-seater which fits on a football field and only requires a crew of about 15 adults to pull on ropes. Though a mooring mast with auto grapples might make it practical. In the case of a serious storm you'd have to deflate the bag and store the gas in cylinders for later reuse. Or, to take a different tack, eat your salad sandwiches, train on a mountain bike and home build a gossamer albatross. That's the human powered aircraft that flew across the English Channel. And there's a foot launchable three axis ultralight sailplane already available. If you buy it, if you build it from plans, the Carbon Dragon by Jim Morpin, which has a 25 to 1 lift drag ratio. The pilot sits in a sling, the floor of the cockpit is hinged like a Bombay door and you can stick your feet out and tippy toe off to the edge of the cliff and jump off the cliff. Foot launched aerodynamically controlled hang glider. 25 to 1 lift drag ratio. You're going to come home with every trophy from every hang glider competition you ever take it into. Alternatively, invent an aero engine which burns alcohol and fly around the cane fields where the refineries and the distilleries grow. Well, actually, that didn't turn out to be too bad a prediction. In the excited states of Norte Americano, there is an aerobatic team flying pit special biplanes, or maybe they're Christian Eagles, but their engines run on pure alcohol grown from corn. And they turn up at air shows and they put on displays and they advertise running piston engines on corn alcohol. So, yeah, that's happening. And... Here's where we get to see the progress that's happened since 2001. 
Another option is to fantasize about electrons, doodle amorphous photovoltaics all over the wings, pencil in hypothetical storage batteries, and plan on amazingly efficient electromechanical transformations. In 1978, an electric powered Easy Riser with photovoltaic wings and a battery had to be foot launched and flown over the gate to enter Oshkosh. The guard hadn't believed it was real. Since the momentous 1978 solar electric entry into Oshkosh, I understand that the endurance deliverable by what you can actually lay hands on has doubled from 5 minutes to 10 minutes of power compared to a petrol aero engine. Or there's the option of power of just enough to sustain level flight for about half an hour. So that would have been back in the days of nickel cadmium batteries I was writing that. Sunlight delivers a thousand watts of photons to every square metre, so you commence with a horsepower for every nine square feet. And in reality, the 18% efficient panels in the shops rarely deliver better than 15% for long, and those are rigid panels. Thin film on plastic, which will conform with your wing section, isn't half that good. But if it were, then every tenth square feet of wing area would deliver 0.0825 of a horsepower, or 60 watts of direct current. So electric flight will consist of lifting up a plane load of batteries for a sled ride unless the current comes from a hydrogen fuel cell bracket fed on compressed hydrogen from the catalyst methane from the chook poo. OK, that's where you'll find the state of the art as it is known and it's not particularly appealing so I thought I'd better come up with something of an improvement, a lateral thought perhaps. If you accept that flying means getting off the ground for the fun of it whereas aviation means going aloft in an expensive machine for some justifiable reason other than having fun, then it is readily seen that a sailplane is almost perfect for flying, while being virtually useless at aviation. Personally, I find it expedient to consider that aeroplanes are for flying while aircraft are for aviating, and thus it's possible to see something designed and built as an aircraft, a Spitfire for example, being converted into an aeroplane by removing all its death machines. Once it becomes useless, it can only be flown for the fun of it. And once you're up there, flying the sailplane is an activity. That's not an aeroplane's arsehole. Flying a sailplane is an activity which is 100% solar powered anyway. So, all we're after is some way to store enough energy and release it again mechanically to launch a sailplane. Ideally, all the equipment to capture the renewable energy stays on the ground and any energy storage in the airframe should weigh close to nothing at the completion of the launch. And it should fit into a smooth high performance design. The simplest way of storing energy is to heat water, which has ten times the thermal mass of steel. It takes a huge amount of energy to raise the temperature of water. Think of it this way, to raise the temperature of one pound of water one degree Fahrenheit takes as much energy as it does to raise the pound of water 768 feet into the sky against a 1G field. Yes, true. Look it up elsewhere if you disbelieve it. So the lowest possible weight solution is a steam rocket at the back of the glider, possibly heated by a large mirror. But the notion of a steam bomb in the event of a mistake, or sizzling in the cockpit if the mirror slips, uh, turns me off the idea. Though a solar steam turbine or even a wood or methane fired steam turbine could power a winch to launch a conventional sailplane. But you will still need somebody else to drive the winch and ideally you should be able to fly solo without troubling anybody else to achieve that. The next lowest weight solution has a better look to it. Use the water as a safely inert yet heavy compact and incompressible reaction mass then store the energy to be used to expel the water in a reservoir of compressed air. At its most simple derivative, an average five-year-old can use one of these. When my kids were in kindergarten, I took a box of compressed air water rockets to school and sent their classmates home to demand their parents make water rockets out of old plastic Coke bottles. When considering the notion of a sailplane to be rocket launched, it would be almost stupid not to at least try to follow the lead of Dr Alexander Lipich, whose tailless sailplane designed for rocket launching remains the only rocket fighter ever put into production. Thus, I commenced to doodle an ultralight ME163B, 
with plywood box spars inside cantilever ply skinned wings with a single retractable wheel instead of the original's skid and a Harrier style tip support retracting into wing tip end plates on each wing. The original was designed as a fat body to contain the Walther rocket's two big fuel tanks and this is ideal for our purposes. Between the wing spars goes the three feet diameter spherical water tank made of Kevlar and holding 66 gallons. Behind the rear spar goes the two foot diameter spherical air tank also made of Kevlar fashioned by resonated sticky fibre ball of string style wrapped around suitably inflated weather balloon. I would expect to test three such tanks to destruction experimentally before feeling I knew what looked right as to wall thickness and safety margins but I'd be trying for a test strength of no less than 2500 psi and a working pressure of 2000 psi or 145 atmospheres. Through a quarter of a square inch of nozzle area, this arrangement delivers roughly 300 pounds of thrust for two minutes, and all the way up the glider loses weight, all 660 pounds of water, or at least most of it. In order to keep the airspeed within limits, then the climb angle has to be pretty steep at the finish of the climb. So about three to five gallons of residual mass should still be inside the tank when the first air reaches the pickup. Apart from increasing penetration, this residue can be used with the remaining compressed air to salvage an undershooting approach. In fact, ideally, most of the compressed air stays inside the system. It all just needs to be stuffed back into the air bottle again before you can refill the water tank. To overcome the extreme inertia at the start of the takeoff of all that water, take a leaf from the Wright Brothers. Catapult assist the first 50 feet with a cable over pulleys to a two ton weight falling from a tower. The reaction mass falls out of the sky. You collect that on the roof of the hangar and you use a wind turbine to drive the air compressor, a three stage one, and the winch on the launch tower as well. So the windmill driven, rocket launched, renewable powered flying machine does indeed appear to be feasible though it's fail dangerous. If a high speed, a high pressure fitting or a tank lets go, it's wham bang splat, 2000 psi, fiberglass shard explosion behind your head. So, that's what the mad scientist fool on the hill had to say in print in 2001. Warbles on a lot to YouTube. Ciao.